All right, baby, today is Tuesday. It is October 17th. Welcome to the Dog Walk, presented by Barstool Sports, here with Chief, as always. Chief, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing all right as well. Um, long uh, long Bears weekend. Yeah. But we're... we're, we're we've, That's the long and short of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the long and short of it. Yeah, we got about... What do we got? 12 games left? Something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should brainstorm a way to make it fun there's got to be a way to do it i don't losing is not fun and losing will never be fun and that's just the long and short all right, of it all right but what if we came up with a way to have fun just during the fall you want to go to a pumpkin patch or something uh maybe a haunted house okay maybe in the middle all right well that's not exactly in the middle but <laughs> we'll figure something out oh man pumpkin patch you don't like a cider donut uh yeah, I like a cider donut. Fuck yeah. Yeah, cider donut. All right, we're going to get that at a haunted house. You got to go to a pumpkin patch for that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's do some apple picking. I just don't want to wait in a line. I heard a lot of the local ones have big lines. Yeah, we might have to take a little trip up to Wisconsin. Just get all the boys in the Tesla, and we'll just drive up and find a good good, uh, good orchard with some some tall trees and and long-ass pumpkin vines. That's what cider, we need. Cider donuts. Yeah, some cider donuts. All right, maybe. Probably not. We probably won't. But, okay. You know, we could. it's a good thought. Uh, today... We're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. I try, listen for the people out there. Uh, you listen to the draft yesterday, and you you listen all throughout the week. Mm -hmm. I tried to get Chief to do Hindenburg, and he's just he has Yo, no it, respect it, for hey, Hindenburg. Hey, if you want to have a six minute podcast, I'm happy to have a six minute podcast. You want to do it right now? No. Okay. Well, I'd like to know about the Hindenburg. Okay, you ready? Is there a documentary on the Hindenburg? Yeah, it's probably about eight minutes long. No way, with dude. With four minutes of opening and closing credits. Hindenburg documentary. All right, there was a doc in 2007. How long was it? 53 minutes. It's a long time to be like this blimp lit on fire. Hindenburg, uh, the Titanic of the seas, of the skies. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, not even really close. Only 36% of the people died. On the Hindenburg? Yeah. Regardless, I only, I only 35 total. For the people lot, who are listening, lot, try to get more. the Hindenburg. Yeah. Chief's like, nope, Cuban Missile Crisis. I was like, all right, fine. Yeah, it was flying over near. This is one of those things where it's like, yeah, it was a blimp crash. It was it was caught on, you know, media. It was like a more of a media thing than like a huge disaster. It's like a Titanic. I think like thousands of people died, right? Hundreds. This yeah, I think, 35 people. I think a thousand people died. Probably. Titanic, Set yeah. the over under at that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of implications and it was the middle of the ocean. This was this blimp had to be happened to be going over Manhattan. And that was a big part of it, and ended up crashing in New Jersey at the end. Some people died, but most lived. Oh, yeah, 1,500 people died. But it was the radio call. Oh, the humanity. I feel like people have heard that before. Kind of gave it some uh, lasting staying power. Yeah. Well, 1,500 people died in the Titanic, so big yep. difference. But, yep. Um, all right, before we get cooking, though, Chief, I do want to talk about Robeck, at Roback Activewear. Excuse yeah. me. I love Roback. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. Listen, falls in full swing. I got to say, I'm not as comfortable as I could be right now. And yeah. that's because I didn't. I wore the rollbacks over the weekend. They weren't ready for uh, for work on Monday because of my inability to do laundry after the Bears. Uh, I wish I was more comfortable. A lot of rollback at the parking lot at Soldier Field. Oh, yeah. It was nice Ton. to see that. Yeah. yeah, it was the perfect I see that dog day. logo everywhere. Yes. Yeah. It was the perfect day for it, too, because it wasn't uh, totally cold Chicago yet. Right. It was a nice October 15th. It was one of those like October days where it's like you have to plan for cloud cover because yeah. if the sun comes out and you're too layered up, you're going to start sweating. Yeah. And it was perfect. For yeah. That. Because the performance hoodies, mm -hmm. they're soft, they're stretchy, and uh, you guys will love living in these things. They also got the, the performance crew neck for both men and women. They're breathable, yet soft and comfortable. They're perfect for a crisp fall morning while you're on the mover having a relaxing weekend like we just described. And uh, finally, the joggers. A lot of joggers out there, too. Mm -hmm. um, they're made to move in, and they're incredibly comfortable. Um, there's always some wearing them here at the Barstool office. So kick off your fall right using code DOG on Roback.com for 20% off your first purchase through the end of this week. That's spelled R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. That's 20% off all performance hoodies, crewnecks, joggers, and more with code DOG. All right, Chief, Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, so um, one of the reasons that we settled on this topic somehow we haven't really done it before 
for all the Kennedy, everything that we've talked about on the show, because I am obsessed, we never got around to like probably his, the biggest moment of his actual presidency, which was navigating the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was going on around right now. So I, that was the thing. Like it was, you know, we're recording on Monday. It was on this day in 1962 that the military and the intelligence community were like, oh, we got a real fucking problem here because they had the U-2 spy planes that went over and took pictures and they're like, that's a nuclear warhead. That's a nuclear warhead. These are like inter- intercontinental long range uh, missiles. So the the first spy, um, um, you two spy plane coverage, like the photos that they found of those missiles, those missiles from Cuba could hit like basically everywhere in the United States except for Seattle. That's how long. So they could just, they were first strike capability for the first time ever uh, in our hemisphere when we were doing the Cold War. And they put them there, and that is that's what kicked it off. So they had this thing. You, you know what the Bay of Pigs is? Yeah. Okay. So the Bay of Pigs, for those who don't know, was this plan to have uh, Cuban exiles um, who like they fled Cuba after the revolution, and they were being trained by the CIA. We we talked about Operation Mongoose here before, and they were going to go in and, and and supposedly knock out Castro with like I don't know a hundred guys and fucking boats storming Normandy without any real military cover that Kennedy didn't want to provide for them, and from that moment on, that really ramped up the Cold War as well. And they were like, "Look, we need defenses from the United States. Like they're always planning these invasions. They're funding these programs. Like they have intelligence services the same way we do. They like they knew." That we that Operation Mongoose was going on even after uh, the Bay of Pigs failed, and they they had aligned themselves with the Soviet Union at this point. So they were like, we need defensive weapons. So the Russians had always been supplying Cuba with quote unquote defensive weapons, and meaning like anti aircraft, uh, you know, all kinds of guns, bullets, whatever, some radar technology. All that stuff was being supplied by Russia, and that those were permitted as quote unquote defensive measures. Then they put in the nuclear arsenal into, into Cuba and that kind of changed the game because for the first time the United States was at threat of being hit with a nuclear bomb or a nuclear, nuclear missile rather, uh, ever. So it was like, we cannot permit this to be in our, in our hemisphere. And the next day after they Kennedy had a meeting with uh, like a, a Russian ambassador and he's like, no, nope, like we only have defensive defensive uh, weapons there. And it just comes into like this discussion, like what is actually defensive? So Kennedy went on TV and revealed to the, you know, to everyone being like, hey, like we have these things, we've been monitoring them. They've put in offensive uh, missiles and they're like, well, wait a second. If those missiles are, are offensive missiles, are your missiles in Turkey also offensive? And they're like, no, those are defensive. We have to protect our allies. And that was like the big discussion at the UN being like, hey, like they're coming over here. They're trying to pick a fight. They know we can't allow those missiles. And the Russians are like, you already have missiles pointed at us from all over the place, including these missiles in Turkey. Like we have no plans and we have n- never showed any aggression towards Turkey. This is the Soviet Union saying this. Why do you have missiles there? It's not to defend Turkey. It's to attack us. And they're like, ah, well, shut up. Basically, basically it was like, that was like the, that was their argument. And the United States was like, well, you have destabilized the entire planet by putting these here. Like we have to defend, we have a responsibility to defend our NATO allies, our EU or, you know, our European allies. Uh, and that's why those missiles are in Turkey. And so those are defensive. So they're basically being like arguing over what is the term, what is it that makes something offensive or, de- or defensive? It's yeah. kind of like your own perspective. Yeah. And uh, so I thought that was that was very interesting. This was at a time when too where Kennedy didn't trust his own military and own own intelligence. He fired everybody, including Alan Dulles and uh, Alan Dulles's number two guy after the Bay of Pigs. He kind of wiped clean uh, the Joint Chiefs after that as well. And th- this is like the first time in like American history where. We had, this is under under Eisenhower, we had this U-2 plane uh, that was flying over Russia, got shot down. It took off from a CIA base in Japan, got shot down, 
And Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, goes to Eisenhower at the time. was like, hey, like, nobody even knows that that base exists in Japan. Nobody knows we even have these type of uh, spy planes that could go at, like, these insane altitudes. And our pilots are so highly trained that uh, if they were to get shot down and captured alive, they have, like, arsenic injections that they will give themselves and they'll commit suicide before they get captured by the Russians. So... Dulles convinces Eisenhower to lie about and like deny like that's I don't know what the Russians are talking about we don't have any spy planes like that we're not doing that thinking that the pilot would be dead and that they could just be like yeah that's some that's their own plane like then they so they go out there and lie and then the Russians put the pilot on on TV be like hey, we we fucking have your guy what do you mean it's not what do you mean it's uh you don't have that spy plane you're not spying on us we have your captured pilot he he didn't give himself the injection. He's like, I can't Gosh, do it. Shit. So this was like, you know, we're at the height of the Cold War. Kennedy doesn't trust his own administration, his own military. He doesn't, you know, the Russians don't trust us. And now you're in this standoff where the stakes are uh, worldwide destruction. Like that's that what that's what was on the line. And everybody had their missiles pointed at each other. And it was like, what's going to be the thing to trigger? So this gets into like another. This is like a war of like definitions. Basically, this whole crisis. So the United States, instead of like just going in and blowing everything up and invading Cuba, because if you do that, then the Russians are going to move in and attack Berlin, Berlin, West Germany. They're a NATO state that immediately triggers that Article Five we've talked about in other podcasts before, and it's World War Three and everybody's shooting missiles at each other and, and it's everybody's dead. So instead of doing, instead of doing that, they opt for a blockade of Cuba where they're going to inspect all the ships that are coming in and any ships that have nuclear warheads are going to be turned around uh, and sent back to Russia. Mm -hmm. So a blockade, and if you're following what's going on in Israel right now, a blockade is also an act of war. So, Hey, we're, we're having a military blockade. Our Navy's going to blockade Cuba. Uh, well, that's an act of war. So that's going to trigger world war three too. So they couldn't call it a blockade they had to call it a quarantine. Like, yeah, it's just a quarantine. So a little bit nicer word, effectively the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they had this, there's this one ship that was already on its way. And like Kennedy went on TV and it was like, it starts, I think it was like 9 a.m. the next day. There's the Alexandrov was the ship had 24 nukes on it bound for Cuba from Russia. So they, that the head of that ship was like, well, we can't, we have to get there before the blockade, the quarantine starts. So they changed where they were gonna go. They went to like the, the closest port possible, which is on like the far Eastern end of Cuba, instead of going in more into like Havana, they're just like dock it anywhere. And they're just like, you have to step on the gas. So they paddled to the metal. They sh send this ship through the blockade line. It beats the blockade timeline by like hours because if they inspected that ship or tried to stop it, and that was the other thing. What, it, what do you do if a ship doesn't want to stop? You got speed too. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what you can do is you fire on their rudder basically and disable it and then board. But then, then what happens? They got guns on those ships. They had, they were, the ships were, were armed. They had armed guards and their own Russian Navy. They also had nuclear subs traveling with the boats. So if you disable that boat, the nuclear sub is going to fire on your warship, your battleship, whatever sink that now we're at world war three there so it's like everything is on like a razor's edge and it's like if you take a false step the entire world is fucked and this this type of like positioning and game plan and strategy went on for weeks and the only thing that really kept us out of war because you had like the hardline guys in in the soviet union were like hey fuck them like they got these missiles here just keep pushing just we'll see well they won't they won't choose war they won't choose war. And Khrushchev had this great line about being like, hey, like I'm pulling on my end, you know, the, ro the war rope is I'm pulling on my end. You're pulling on your end. The only thing we're going to do is make that knot in the middle even harder to undo. So everybody just chill the fuck out. Mm -hmm. And they, they kind of just Khrushchev and Kennedy through like basically what it was called a teletype. It's kind of like a fax machine. They were sending messages back and forth. And at one point, Khrushchev was like, hey, if you like, give us a pledge not to invade Cuba and we'll start to pull those missiles out. Okay. And he sent that like a personal one. 
he sent another letter that was like basically made the United States think that, you know, they're going, they're itching for war. So it was like, he had hardline people on his side base pushing for war. We had the joint chiefs that wanted to come in and knock out, uh, all of their defenses, their missiles. Like we have to take these people out now. Everybody like around the two leaders wanted seemingly wanted to start a war. Like this is a, like, this is what we do. We do war. We're war guys. We're going to go. And the, the Kennedy and Khrushchev who had both fought in world war two, Khrushchev actually fought in two wars, world war one and world war two. And he's like, they, we don't want to, they had like their wits about them. Like we can't like in good conscience set the world on this path. So they like kind of just negotiated through each other. And eventually the Kennedys, because Bobby was very involved in negotiations as well, was like, we will give you that pledge. And we're going to ignore that second letter where it was like all this hardline crazy talk. We're just going to pretend that never existed. So they back channel a whole deal where it's like, we're going to take out those missiles in Turkey that you're so upset about because you think they're offensive you have to take out your missiles under UN inspection. We will pledge not to invade Cuba. And then in six months, we're gonna remove those missiles from Turkey. And, but we're not, we're not gonna say that it's related to this. And if you say that you like got a win because we pulled them out under pressure, well then the deal's off and we're going to war. So that was like the stipulation being like, everybody just shut up and we'll, we'll do what you want, but you're gonna have to wait six months and then we'll just kind of reset the deck. And that's how, that's how that whole thing on wow good and you had like these situations where kennedy was in like the situation room and he didn't trust the secretary of the navy the secretary of defense any of the joint chiefs so they had like the pentagon they were able to communicate with the the you know the captain of the ship the admiral of that ship that was going to fire on the sub and at the last second kennedy's like i don't want to play like a game of telephone put me through to the, to the, it was the USS Pierce, put me through to the Admiral of the Pierce directly. Like, I want to talk to this guy myself, no intermediary. So like the message gets lost. So like you have the president of the United States just talking to a guy like, Hey, what, like, what's the situation where you are right now? Because that's how little he trusted everyone else around, which is fucking wild. That's a problem. Yeah. And it <laughs> makes you wonder like, like how much of this stuff goes on like right now? Cause you see like the world, there's a lot of like saber rattling going on where like Iran is saying, did you see this this morning hmm. with the whole Israeli Palestinian thing? So Iran is like the sponsor of Hamas is what everybody says. And Iran had released a statement supposedly today saying, um, if you end or if you, you know, if you stopped like the, the siege where you turn the water back on, uh, the electricity back on and stop the bombing, we will release the hostages taken by Hamas. That's Iran said that. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like in this situation, Hamas and Gaza is Cuba. Mm -hmm. And then the big dogs are the ones, you know, Israel, Israel, I guess would be us and Iran would be the Soviet Union. And they're like, like, I know it's on your on your territory, but we're in charge here. So because that's what it was like. Russia was Castro didn't have much to say or to do with any of the policy or the deals that are getting made. It was just the two big dogs. And that's kind of what's going on right now, too, because Hamas was out and like, no, we don't we're not doing that deal mm -hmm. with the hostages. Like, no, we, like, we deny that. Like, we, and then but Iran's trying to like broker a deal. So there's not like this big thing that spirals out of control. We have we have two um like carrier strike forces like in the area right now so it's like if iran and hezbollah open up a second front in israel then i think we might get involved and then it's like we're in direct conflict with iran and then who knows where else that goes iran's got a good relationship with putin and russia that's still an ongoing and it's just like you can it feels now everything is still like on edge the way it was 60 years ago, but it's a different part of the world. And it's, it's like one more step. It's not just Russia and the United States have the nukes. So you have to go from like Iran doesn't have it, but if we got involved and then Russia came down to support Iran, you could see it spiraling the same way. So it's like, everybody is still like, you know, you're communicating like through Twitter 
kind of the way that Kennedy and Khrushchev were doing like on the teletype, like way back. Like they're sending things directly to each other. They're communicating publicly through the media and through Twitter about like what the next steps are. And it's like every, you know, so it's like, are they going to release these hostages and end the siege or is like the bombardment and the invasion of Gaza going to actually happen? And then what is the response? Because I think there will be a response from somebody if they just level the entire city. So and has the population density of Tokyo. It's like one of the most densely populated places Jesus. in the world is Gaza. Yeah. So it's, it is like, we're, we're in like a, a new like razor's edge crisis. It feels like right now. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. Uh, so what's Castro's deal? What do you mean? Like, it seemed like once he died, mm -hmm. like things kind of settled down a lot. I know they, oh, they, there were, we were allowed to travel there for a little bit, but then I think that got closed again. I think it was more. So he was just, it was just one guy kind of holding the whole country. Yeah. Know. It was him, his brother and Che Guevara. And that was like another thing in the Cuban missile crisis. Like, they were preparing. They're like on the side. They were, Castro was on, like he was still communicating with Khrushchev, who was the, you know, the head of Russia at the time, but he was on the sidelines for the negotiation. So all he could do was prepare his own people. So he gave for military operations. Che Guevara had half the country. His brother had the other half. And they were, you know, doing a crash course to get these missiles built, get all the, take up all these defensive positions. And then they actually shot down a spy plane over Cuba towards the end of the crisis. And that's the type of thing that would be like, all right, well, they got one of our guys. They killed a U.S. serviceman. We're at war now. And they kind of just ignored that that happened in order to get like the long standing peace. So it's like one guy had to die in order to prevent hundreds of millions of people from dying. And that's kind of how that went. And so what was Castro's deal? He... He was like an opportunist, so he took – Cuba had always – Cuba is like a fascinating place where it was owned by the Spanish. Then we won the Spanish-American War. The Spanish got out. They were like their own independent thing, but really largely influenced by American corporations. So big sugar would go in. They had all these sugar plantations that you know, Coca-Cola would have, uh, the United Fruit Company. There are all these like giant, giant U.S. corporations and in industries – gambling from the mob bosses, all these people had interest in Cuba and Castro came in and kind of Nash kicked everybody out and nationalized everything, which is why the CIA and, and, and like Ameri like the, the American industrialists were pushing Kennedy and Eisenhower to take Cuba back because it's like, we have, we've invested millions and millions and millions of dollars into that Island. And now it's just gone because Castro took it and went communist. And then I think, you know, about when th when he died, things chilled out a little bit. Depends on who you ask, but it's not this open conflict anymore because the Soviet Union and Cuba don't Soviet Union doesn't exist. So once the Soviet Union dissolved, Cuba no longer had like a giant superpower Back propping in, up their yeah. economy. Have you ever seen? Uh, it was one of the Anthony Bourdain shows. He went to Havana, and he went to a baseball game. And they're playing, this is you know, probably seven, eight years ago. And he, he was during the day. And he's like, how come they're playing all the games during the day? And he's like, well, all the lights are out. We can't afford to fix them. So the stadium lights went out. So their only option was to play day games. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like that's, and then it's, when you see like pictures and videos of stuff, it's like it's going in the time machine because they didn't have the ability to get new anything because of the sanctions and they didn't have any money. So if you had a car in 1958, right before the revolution, that's still the car you're driving and your family, like everybody you, and people take like, they're just in pristine condition. So it's like traveling back in time, supposedly when you go there, I've always wanted to go, but it's like, they still, they just have no money. So Castro dies. I think maybe his brother died too, Raul, cause Raul stepped up and he was in charge. I actually don't know who's the, leader of Cuba right now. Um, Miguel Diaz Canal. Yeah, I have no idea who that is, but he's, uh, he is a member of the Communist Party, so they're still like a one-party government. They're not, not a free place, but they tried to normalize. Obama really tried to normalize some relations and open things up, 
and you know maybe through through like diplomacy you know and, and trade soften them up and make them more of an ally more capitalist uh, and then I think Trump came in and like kind of repealed some of those policies. So I don't really know where Cuba stands now, but it's it's like a shame. It's just like this beautiful place so close to America that is very very poor. So through through policy, like it should be, it should probably be a pretty well developed nation. They've got a lot of resources. They're a great location, but they just you know they're still a communist country. So they have some things that go well for them, like their supposedly their education and their healthcare. It's, so they say like very good uh but they don't have any real business or anything to show for it so it's like they're it feels like they're still trying to find their place in the world post post castro and and post cold war because they were they were like the the thorn in our side for a long time because they're 90 miles from our coast and they're aligned with our biggest rival who can you know set the world on fire anytime they wanted so it's it's just not as openly hostile as it was back then because the Soviet Union collapsed. But it was like Havana was awesome back in the day, right? Dude, you see those pictures and it's like this place is a paradise. Yeah. And they were trying to make it like Las Vegas of the East because mm-hmm. they had like Las Vegas had really just gotten started. We, I think we've done a podcast on that before too in the 50s and they were making money hand over fist. And it's like, well, that's like it's three hours from California, but it's way far away from everywhere else in the country where all the people live. Yeah. But it's a short flight from it's not that far from new york or like you might take a two-hour flight to havana instead of taking a seven eight hour flight to to vegas you know Mm because they didn't probably didn't have direct flights back there so it was a lot easier to get to so it's like let's make havana where we have a friendly government who back then it was friendly in the 50s let us do whatever the fuck we want taxes will be minimum we'll just pay the right guys off and we'll build these businesses here these resorts and we'll be like the number one tourism place in the world and then Castro came in and stole everything. They they do a pretty good job of uh, having that as a subplot in the second Godfather movie, where they have Hyman Roth, mm-hmm. and Hyman Roth was uh, a liar, man, or My- Meyer Lansky in real life, and he was the guy who was like trying to orchestrate that mm-hmm. whole thing among yeah. among others. But it was yeah, like that was it. Be it's like a weird thing where it's like, can you imagine if if Castro doesn't win the revolution, like who? Cuba might be the 51st state, you know, like there's so many different things like that came out of that Spanish American conflict at the beginning of the, of the century that could have just changed the history of the world forever. Yeah. It is crazy to think about. Yeah. I'm going to Key West this weekend. So maybe I'll have to charter a little boat, get some boots on the ground. I think that you would probably not make it back. (laughs) So I would would recommend against that, but yeah, that would, I would love to do, I would love to do like, Hey, let's go to Toronto for a bit and then we'll just, stamp our passports down in Havana and come back through Toronto. I feel like there's like loopholes to get in there. To do that? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. All right, then. Crazy shit. It is crazy. Crazy shit. It's like the more things change, the more they stay the same sort of thing. Yeah, right. Um, All right, then, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Chief. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow with a free swim. We'll see you guys on.